Raoul Mote was born on the 17th of June in Gateshead in the northeast of England. He was raised largely by his grandmother. Um, his mother had some mental health issues, but she lived in the, the local area, so, so he did have some contact with her. Um, but it wasn't anything really out of the ordinary. A, a lot of families have to cope with that kind of thing. During the 1970s and 80s, the northeast of England was an area in economic decline. Its traditional heavy industries, such as shipbuilding and mining, were phased out and many men lost their jobs. It wasn't a particularly economically prosperous area, so it was always going to be a challenge for Moat to find his way in the world as a man. Many teenagers go through a lot of changes, particularly at momentous points in their teenage years. When Moat was 16, he left school, and there were some changes in him around about that time. So he became quite fixated on bodybuilding. And this is something that you often find with young working class lads in an area where the prospects of those, those traditional kind of tough men's jobs are few and far between. They look to other ways to, to become men, to make themselves visibly masculine. And I think that was what Moat was doing. When you see the results, then in, in anything, you, you get more, oh wow, this is working. So then he went in more and more, and then he started getting into steroids. It was clear that Moat had had some serious psychiatric problems growing up, and he'd obviously decided to express himself as the big fella around town. He was six foot three, 17 stone, and liked this idea of being a large, well built, muscle bodybuilder, and he clearly used a lot of steroids. and. People who were close to him talked time and time again about just what a terrible temper he'd got. Moat was somebody who has what I would describe as poor behavioural control. So somebody who flies off the handle quite easily, somebody who's quite readily aggravated. And if you throw steroids into the mix, you, you get what people often refer to as roid rage, you know, a real inability to control your temper. And it increases the levels of testosterone in the body. So when somebody has a predilection towards aggression, and then you add that on top of it, you've got a really toxic mix. Moat had found work as a tree surgeon, and his physical appearance came in handy in his other role as a nightclub doorman. By 2005, the 32-year-old was caught by the police carrying a knuckle duster and a samurai sword. He'd fallen foul of the law on numerous occasions. He was known to the police for incidents uh, of domestic abuse. He had a number of partners with which he had troubled relationships with and the police were involved. He had had arrests for, generally speaking, uh, low-level violence. By 2010, 37-year-old Moat had fathered several children with different partners. His latest girlfriend, Samantha, was 15 years his junior. They'd been in an on-and-off relationship for six years and had a daughter together. Well, the relationship between Samantha and Moat was an incredibly controlling one. It's one that I classify as coercively controlling. So Moat believed that Samantha was his possession. He was in control, he decided what happened, and she basically had to suck it up and get on with it. So it was his rules. Um, everything was, was focused around him and he would control everything. He would control her movements, um, what she could buy, could not buy, what she did, you know, who she talked to on the phone. So obviously Samantha would probably feel like completely controlled. She didn't have the right to do anything. You often find in relationships like this, women are kind of treading on eggshells, trying not to upset their abusive partner. But at the same time, it's very, very difficult for them to leave. Often looking from the outside, we say, well, why are you staying in this relationship? And often it's to keep themselves safe because they know that if they were to leave, they'd put themselves in quite a significant amount of danger. Samantha was desperate to leave Raoul Moat, and in the spring of 2010, a chance presented itself. Moat was convicted of assaulting a family member and sentenced to 18 weeks in Durham prison. Moat's anger was uncontrollable. He decided he was going to kill Christopher Brown as soon as he got out of jail. He enlisted the help of a friend, Carl Ness. 
Moat started planning this while he was in prison. He recruited or he used Carl Ness to keep an eye on Samantha and do what, is a, what we would call surveillance by watching a house, seeing who comes and goes, identifying vehicles, and try and identify who the new boyfriend was. On Thursday, the 1st of July, 2010, 37-year-old Raoul Moat was released from prison. He didn't waste any time. It's alleged that Carl Ness had found a shotgun for him to use. The way in which Moat planned this was quite meticulous. He took steps to try and identify the, 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 the karate instructor, i.e. Christopher, by making phone calls to, to health centres, to karate clubs, to, um, to the extent that he actually drove around the routes that they took on the fatal night. Uh, they actually had a, a, a dry run, if you like, on the Thursday night. On Friday the 2nd of July, staff at Durham Prison warned Northumbria police that Moat might pose a risk to Samantha. But, unfortunately, the information wasn't acted upon. The same day, Moat was captured on CCTV in Newcastle, sporting a Mohican hairstyle. Later that night, Carl Ness drove Moat to nearby Gateshead, where Samantha and Christopher were at a house party. Moat was dropped off quite near the address that Samantha and Christopher were visiting, and he was able to walk in there and hide himself uh, underneath the front window next to the front door, where he was able to listen because it was a July night, the window was open, it was warm. He could hear people talking and, and saying things, and he picked up on things that were being said about him or things that he perceived to be about him. And he started texting his friend Ness and, and expressing his anger and frustration at what he was hearing. This is going on, it's really annoying me. He's essentially venting. And this is something that you see narcissistic people do quite a lot. They want an audience for their complaints and their rants. They want validation. They want other people to agree with them and say, yeah, you're completely reasonable. Moat lay in wait outside the house. Around about 2.30 in the morning, Samantha and Christopher leave. And as they come out the front door, Moat stood up, he was clearly armed with a gun and, and pretty much without warning, he immediately shot Christopher. Christopher started trying to run away and as he tried to run across the grass area, he was shot again, which was enough to make him fall. Moat then calmly walked over, reloaded his gun uh, in front of witnesses and then shot him a third time, causing his death was nothing more than a cold and calculated assassination. It was a public execution. Moat had used a sawn-off shotgun to shoot Christopher Brown at point-blank range. On the evening of Friday the 9th of July, the nation was glued to their television sets as the drama unfolded. But this wasn't a film, it was real life. The police were dealing with a man who was erratic, armed and extremely dangerous. We had police negotiators who were there on the scene, face to face, who spent the next six hours or so speaking to him and trying to persuade him that the right thing to do was put the gun down and surrender himself to custody. The police were determined to make sure that Moat came out of the standoff alive. The presence of the media added extra pressure on their performance. You're there focused on doing your job, but you're doing your job in the knowledge that there's lots of people watching you, scrutinising you, and some of them judging you. But Moat wasn't planning on giving himself up so easily, and the case continued to attract media attention. An extraordinary part of this story was the involvement of celebrities, almost as the manhunt came to its dramatic and fatal climax, we got the almost bizarre scene of Gaza, Paul Gascoigne, famous England footballer, turning up in his dressing gown, claiming to know Raoul Moat and offering Moat chicken and lager if he gave himself up. 
Didn't come to anything. The police just asked Gaza to politely leave the town and had nothing more to do with it. As the night of Friday the 9th of July turned into the early hours of Saturday, the situation remained tense. Negotiations with Moat weren't working, and he remained where he was with a gun pointed at his own head. It was an incredibly long and tense night. Darkness fell. We really could see very little of what was going on. We could just see the outlines of the police cordon. And the night dragged on after midnight into the small hours. And it was around one o'clock in the morning when there was a dramatic series of events, hard to make out. It was confused, it was dark, it was very difficult to know exactly what the sequence of events were. In one last attempt to capture Moat, the police decided to use a taser on the 37-year-old. They were determined to take him alive. On this occasion, the tasers that were used were long tasers, like shotgun-style tasers, uh, which hadn't yet been approved for use by the police. When you're in a mindset and a determination to uh, arrest somebody, to call them to account for the crimes that they've committed in the safest possible way, then it was right and proper that it was given a try. Uh, it didn't work. At approximately 1.15 a.m. on Sunday the 10th of July, the sound of a shotgun blast, followed by shouting, signaled that Raoul Moat had taken his own life. Horst Kroner was born in the small town of Friedberg in Bavaria, Germany. Kroner himself described his childhood as unhappy and miserable, and in later years blamed this for all his troubles. What is clear, however, is that Kroner from a very early age felt that the world was against him. Oh, I was so miserable, um, I was suicidal, my life was a misery. Er sagt, he said, yes, obviously I had parents, but in a narrower sense, I have never received love. And what bothered me most was that in my parents' home, I basically did not receive any recognition. I was a human being too, but I had the feeling that I was not counted as such. And that resulted in his low self-esteem and in fact made him a social outsider. Jörg Heinzel was a local journalist who covered the case. He talked about himself, that he got little from his parents. They were both at work. They both worked a lot, and therefore he spent the majority of his time as a child with his grandmother and was brought up by his grandmother. Kroner worked as an IT technician, but he was not happy with his life. Horst Kroner says that every so often he had suicidal thoughts because he believed he could not survive in everyday social life. He was always stressed, he said. This is to some extent understandable. He had changed his place of work a total of ten times. He sometimes felt bullied at work, but sometimes he resigned out of his own free will. Essentially, he led an unsettled life for a very long time. Kroner had a fascination with women from Southeast Asia and was married twice before. He had met his wives through a dating agency, newspaper adverts, or, in the last case, on the Internet. He clearly did not have the confidence to approach a woman at a party or maybe in a supermarket or through other opportunities. I assume that this man indeed had problems with women. Kroner wanted to be in a relationship and met his third wife again on the internet. 27-year-old Grace was from the Philippines. She moved to Germany and married 42-year-old Kroner in March 2005. 
That suggests to me that, that he's targeting a particular group of women from particular cultures where they have a more traditional idea of, of femininity and of masculinity, uh, women who, who take that traditional nurturer caregiver role that he is going to find easier to, to be in control of. Grace embraced her new life. She learned to speak German and fully integrated into the small town of Friedberg. The smart IT tech had formed what he thought was a foolproof plan to kill his wife and get away with it. I think that the fact he has a high IQ and he's an intelligent man is significant in relation to this crime. He's going to be thinking through the process more. He's going to be trying to, to cover up. He's going to be thinking about all of those things that could potentially trip up somebody who wasn't as intelligent. Kroner didn't just plan the murder, he also needed to ensure the body would not be discovered. Nachdem Horst Kröner für sich entschieden hat, ich werde meine Frau töten, hat er... After Horst Kröner had decided to kill his wife, he searched the internet looking for possibilities, for an airtight way to pack the corpse so the body wouldn't start to smell. He wanted to know how to kill his wife, so he made related searches. He wanted to kill her as quickly and as painlessly as possible. He looked up. If I cut up her body, which I will have to do if I kill her in our apartment, where can I dispose of the body? By analyzing his search records, investigators later discovered that Kroner had made a grim to-do list. The first thing he did was to buy a five-pound hammer and duct tape. For ease of access, he hid the hammer in the dining room cabinet. He didn't have a weapon readily available in the basement, as in cases where spontaneous murders happen. Instead, he had bought one specifically from the hardware store. He had also searched and read information on the internet on the subject of storage rental. He didn't buy everything in advance. Some things he only bought right after the murder took place. Kroner later revealed his twisted justification behind the callous decision to murder his wife. Actually, the reasons he gave as to why he came up with the idea that he had to kill his wife were not really comprehensible. He always said that he actually wanted to kill himself because he had so many problems and his life was too hard for him. On Monday, the 30th of November 2015, the day of reckoning had arrived. Kroner waited until the early hours of the morning to be sure that his wife was asleep. Then he took the hammer out of the dining room cabinet, walked into the bedroom, and hit Grace as hard as he could in the head. He had murdered his wife and was now finally free to satisfy his selfish appetites. He just wanted his holiday. And for that holiday, he didn't care. He had to kill her, chop her up, put her inside a box, fill the box with foam, and then try to hide the box somewhere. He, he did not care what he had to do. So it's a complete lack of emotion towards somebody that he actually shared a life with. And to me, that is it's the worst type of psychopath you can, you can have. There are an awful lot of men who kill their wives and then seek to take a terrible revenge on the body. Not always going to the lengths that Kroner went to of meticulously cutting it up and storing it in plastic boxes that didn't smell, but the level of rage and the level of anger that killing your wife means is very, very difficult to quantify from the outside. It's beyond most people's wildest imaginings. It is a problem all over the world that there will be women everywhere losing their lives at the hands of their partner or their ex-partner. So when we look at cases like the Krona case, it's just the extreme end of the wedge. It's the tip of the iceberg. The next day, he set about covering his tracks. First, Krona stashed the body parts in a storage unit in his hometown of Friedberg. Determined to get away with murder, Kroner then put his escape plan into motion. He had carefully prepared reasons why he and Grace were absent. 
There was, of course, the fact that they had requested leave from their respective employers because they wanted to go on holiday together to the Philippines. And he had also laid false tracks. When he dropped a note to the neighbors, he wrote that Grace had left him and he was now flying after her to see what was left of their marriage to save. And he would get in touch again. On the 2nd of December 2015, two days after he murdered his wife, Kroner boarded a plane to Thailand. He spent most of the time in Pattaya, which is a known place for sex tourism. And there, he met with several women, including one he had already contacted over the internet, and he admitted himself that he also had had sex with these women. Back home in the small town of Friedberg, at first no one suspected a thing. There were already different false tracks laid, so that only after Mrs. Kroner's holiday ended did her colleagues from work start to get worried, as well as members of their church congregation who questioned why they had not turned up. People then tried to make contact but were unsuccessful. When the usually reliable Grace did not show up for work or for her regular church services, suspicions grew. Finally, just before Christmas in December 2015, a concerned friend reported Grace missing to the local police. Actually, at the beginning of the inquiries, there was no evidence that Grace had indeed traveled. People had also contacted her family. She wasn't there, and nobody knew of a holiday trip or a visit home, and so it became ever more apparent that she had practically disappeared without a trace. A search of the flat that Horst Kroner and his wife Grace shared drew a blank. There were no clues to indicate foul play or to the couple's whereabouts. After the act, he tidied up and cleaned up everything very thoroughly. He put the rug on which he cut up the body on the balcony, rolled up. But nobody noticed that at first. However, a small blood splatter was found in the bedroom but no one knew that a murder had taken place. Police soon discovered that Horst Kroner had booked a ticket for himself alone to Thailand. But with no body found, the case against Kroner was circumstantial. Nonetheless, for investigators, Kroner was the prime suspect. Well, it is almost the classic question whether it's murder fact or murder fiction, isn't it? Uh, who's the first person you're likely to die at the hands of? It's almost certainly to be your husband. That's why most murderers uh, know their victims and most victims know their murderers. Um, probably the most likely victim of all is a wife and the most likely killer of all is a husband. On the 8th of January 2016, Horst Kroner returned to Germany and was arrested the next day. Then, in a curious twist, Kroner confessed to his crimes and led police to the storage unit where they recovered Grace's body. This killer's story begins in 1987. David Heiss was born on June the 19th to a Bolivian mother and a German father in Frankfurt, West Germany. He was the eldest of two children. Affluent, he had quite a leafy suburban upbringing, but he was unhappy. Heiss's childhood is quite a, a turbulent one. So his parents separated when he was six and his mother went on to remarry. After his parents divorced, it was decided that Heiss would live with his grandparents near Limburg and Delan. And he was effectively brought up by his grandmother and grandfather, to whom he was close. I think he feels like he's the outcast. And when you have those, those interruptions, those disruptions in the attachment that somebody has with their parents, their primary caregivers, that starts to have an impact on the relationships that they have with other people. Heiss's mother remarried and went on to have more children. I think here we've got an individual who feels like he never really sort of fits in. His mother's formed a new family unit, so I think there's always that feeling of being an outsider, of being awkward, of, of not having a sense of belonging in the family. His mother, a nurse, 
Still lived in the town, but he barely spoke to her, and his father was even more distant from him. As a result, Heiss became insular and isolated. Heiss is put out to pastures, and the message in there to the child is, is very simple. Love can't be counted. The closest thing to you can just set you aside and go on to a new life as if it's nothing. This creates a desperate sense of insecurity. I think very early on in those early years, we're, we're starting to see the seeds sown for a, a disruptive adulthood, for somebody who's gonna have difficulties with relationships, but it becomes an awful lot worse than that. Estranged from his parents, Heiss also struggled to make friends. He was an isolated child. He took refuge, as so many adolescents do now, in the net, in his bedroom, his computer. The teen would spend up to eight hours a day on the internet and developed a passion for online gaming. His social interaction was limited to other gamers. Here's somebody who doesn't have great relationships with his peers, so he seeks solace online. He makes friendships with people in the virtual world, and the, the virtual world is, is very different from the real one because you've got a lack of social cues. You've got that lack of kind of eye contact, of, of seeing a person face to face. And I think this is something that actually suited him down to the ground. At school, Heiss excelled academically, but he couldn't afford to go to university. It was a fact that rankled him. I think he felt from a very early age, that's what I was due. I want to be at a university. He was clearly clever enough, but it wasn't possible. Age 19, he decided to join the military but after just two weeks, he was discharged for not being mentally suitable. Instead, Heist took up an apprenticeship at a textile dye production company. And in itself, that, coupled with his extraordinarily isolated childhood, turned him into a introverted, unhappy, complicated boy who had never come to terms with any kind of relationship and things would only get worse for the troubled teen when his grandfather died in 2007. At approximately 1 a.m., David Heiss made his way to Joanna and Matthew's flat. We've got images of him putting his bag down, walking up the road, hiding his bag, coming back, spending a lot of time just thinking what he was going to do. He doesn't knock on the door. He sleeps outside the flat beside an air conditioning unit, which was presumably giving out some heat. It's not the depths of winter, but it still was cold. Joanna and Matthew had no idea that Heiss was back in the country and just metres away from them. When Joanna got up in the morning in order to go to work, um, she kissed uh, Matthew goodbye and she walked out. And he specifically waits for Joanna to go out to work in the morning. He watches her leave. He's now decided that the only way he can have her is if he kills her boyfriend, Matthew. With Joanna now out of sight, Heiss made his way up to their flat. He's got gardening gloves with him. He's got a weapon with him. This is premeditated. This is planned. This is something that he intends to do. It is very execution-like in style. Heiss then knocked on the door. The moment that Matthew opens the door. David Heiss launches himself at him, stabbing him repeatedly. And indeed, stabbing him relentlessly with the knife that he's brought specifically for the purpose. In a cruel and frenzied attack, Heiss chased Matthew around the small flat. Matthew had gone into the fetal position behind the closed door and then managed to escape and go uh, running down the corridor and into the lounge could see evidence of where he um, had banged into uh, items such as doors uh, or cupboards and where the, the blood was smeared. And then he was pursued, uh, you know, across into the corner of his um, uh, bedroom come lounge. David Heiss had viciously stabbed Matthew a total of 86 times. 
So this is something that is way more than you need to do to end a person's life. He didn't just want to kill Matthew, he wanted to completely obliterate him and, and have complete control. He was very incensed that this barrier was in the way to getting the thing that he wanted, which was the relationship with Joanna. So killing him wasn't enough. To stab somebody 86 times actually takes time, it takes energy, it takes effort. It tells you that somebody really, really means to cause that person very serious harm. We would normally describe this sort of murder as um, a sustained assault. This is not a moment of madness. This is planned, it's calculated. It's just an explosion of cathartic rage. He has been between him and his true love from the day that they met. Despite his horrific injuries, Matthew managed to leave a clue to his killer at the scene of the crime. To Matthew's eternal credit, he managed, in his last moments, to write the first three letters of David Heiss's name in his own blood on his computer console. He wrote D-A-V, presumably hoping that someone would recognise what that meant and lead the police to David Heiss. In one sense, the fact that he was still conscious enough, still willing enough to try and identify his assailant, to write the first three letters of his name on a monitor shows how strong he was. But at the same time, it tells us that he was conscious. He knew what he was doing throughout the whole of that attack. Tragically, Matthew died from his horrific injuries. Heiss had thought he'd committed the perfect murder, but he was now the police's main suspect. They just needed to find him. The police were now looking into the killer's background. Well, we started to make some investigations uh, around Heiss and where he was from. The only thing that we'd got from some of the gamers was that he maybe lived um, near Frankfurt and we didn't have any other information. After talking to other gamers, the police discovered that Heiss was apparently online the morning that Matthew was murdered. We had managed to convince his sister that he was uh, going away overnight to a party and that he needed somebody to manage his online account and then got his sister to log on to the computer. We were really concerned about that. Had we got this right? Even though he'd killed Matthew, Heiss continued to act innocent to the other gamers. When he was back in Germany, he began to say, how is Matthew, and has anybody heard from Matthew? Well, Matthew was dead. However, the police were still convinced that Heiss was their main suspect. But since he was an online gamer, they had no idea where to find him. Then there was a breakthrough in the case. Information came through about the car crash that Heiss was involved in back in August. And the fact that the police had attended that crash and what had happened was that um, some items had been sent to Heiss from the car by the Treble A, it's like the European version of the recovery service in the UK. And that gave us a couple of addresses that linked to Heiss. So we were then able to go to the courts in the UK um, we give them enough information that suggests we should arrest this individual. With a European arrest warrant, the police went through Europol and made contact with the German authorities. Ufa Quimbach and Rashid Barouch were assigned to the case. After receiving a formal request, we carried out the background checks. The only thing we knew was that he was a young man that lived in the district of limburg valburg He didn't show up in any police records, so we found nothing. It was a total blank slate for us. Heiss, unaware that he was being investigated, decided to send Joanna a message on Facebook four days after he'd murdered her boyfriend. He wrote a note which said, I'm sorry for causing you so much trouble. I hope you won't lose all your hope. We will be there for you. That gives you an indication of the distortion of Heiss's mind. We will be there for you? No, I think what he really meant was, I will be there for you. What he really hoped is that Joanna would fall into his arms, that she'd somehow be won over 
by the fact that he'd eliminated her boyfriend. This is a very clumsy attempt at trying to worm his way back into her affections. And this really does, again, show his complete lack of judgment, his, his complete lack of awareness of, of social norms, of, of ways to behave when, when somebody has, has died. It reflects a complete inability to see the world from, from the perspective of the victim. Meanwhile, the German authorities now had an address for Heiss, and on the 24th of September, he was finally arrested.